started, just a reminder that this will be posted on YouTube and shared uh, with those who are worshiping from home. Uh, we have communion packets in the back. We'd like to thank Christine Brown for making uh, two little boxes there for singlet communions and, and dual packs of communion. So if you need a communion pack, uh, just raise your hand and we can have one of our ushers bring you one. Reminder about our Wednesday night Bible study at 7 p.m. There's a link on our website. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're still uh, having our Wednesday night Bible study on Zoom. Sunday school is back in session at 9 a.m. Uh, we've been having a great class on Sunday mornings, so we encourage everyone to join us for that. Today is the last day to contribute to our backpack drive. Uh, we've got backpacks and school supplies going for uh, kids in the Macomb District who are in need, who are going back to in-person school. Everything will be delivered to the MISD tomorrow, so we're thankful for everyone's generosity in that. Remember in our prayers, Sue's daughter, Laura, and her sister, Carol, continue to remember them in your prayers. Uh, Paul Sturgis will be seeing a surgeon soon, so keep him in your prayers. Omar's brother-in-law was in a car accident in Texas and was in a coma, but is now awake and getting better. So remember Omar's brother in your prayers. Uh, Melissa's mother is also uh, in need of prayers. She's going to need back surgery, so remember Melissa's mom. Catherine Gervin has requested prayers for her brother Gordon, who is diagnosed with liver cancer, so remember Catherine Gervin's brother Gordon. Remember Julie Randy's sister-in-law, who's having heart issues. We've been praying for her co-worker Laura Furr, or Fuhrer, um, who was battling COVID. She was hospitalized in early July. She was on a ventilator. They took her off the ventilator, and she has since passed. So remember Julie's friend and her family in your prayers. Uh, also, our brother and sister Callie and Sen uh, Kenny and Sally. Uh, Callie and Senny. My goodness. Sally and Kenny. Wow. That's called a spoonerism when you do that. That's what that's technically called when you... Uh, never mind. <laughs> Kenny and Sally are asking for prayers as they're faced with uh, having to move out of their um, apartment due to the, some of the conditions in their apartment complex. So remember Kenny and Sally in your prayers. Uh, continue to remember our sister Paula. Her dad is um, still in need of prayers. And uh, remember him in your prayers. That's all the announcements I have for this morning. If there are any others, please note them to me and they'll be mentioned at a later time. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We're thankful for this time together to worship you, Lord, this, this time that we can gather together and sing songs of praise and, and hear a, a portion of your word, Lord. We ask you to be with all those who are going to lead us in this service, that you can give them the courage and the confidence to shake off their anxieties, Lord, that they can lead this service in a, in a way that's pleasing to you, Lord. We ask you to be with our brother Brian as he brings us the message. We ask you to be with, be with our brother Joseph as he leads us in song, Lord. And we ask you to be with all of us as we pray and sing together, Lord, as we seek to serve you and bring you the glory this hour. Forgive us of our sins, Lord, and guide us to sin no more. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. This morning's songs posted on my left here. Or on the screen in front of you if you're with us at home. If you would turn with me to song number 95 for our uh, scripture reading and open prayer. 95.
reading this morning is taken from Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through the end of the chapter. Philippians chapter 2. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Can you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful, dear Lord, for this opportunity we have to come together and study your word together, to sing praises unto your name, to gather around this table, dear Lord, and commune with you, to hear your word preached, dear Lord. We are so thankful to be your children. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, for all those who were mentioned, who are grieving, who are undergoing tests, who are anxious, dear Lord, who are worried, those who are in need of your loving hand, dear Lord, which would be all of us. We pray, dear Lord, that you will guide your children. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you will bless our worship service this morning, all those involved, we pray, dear Lord, that our worship is edifying and uplifting to everyone here, but most of all, dear Lord, we pray our worship is acceptable to you. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you will continue to guide us to better serve one another, dear Lord, and through that, better serve you. Pray, dear Lord, that you'll forgive us when we fail. Pray that you'll continue to watch over us, dear Lord. We pray that all that we do as we travel through this life, dear Lord, we could do in a way that would bring glory unto your name and, ask, and have people ask, what is it, dear Lord, that we have? We can tell them you. We pray that you'll watch us, guide us, dear Lord. All these things we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, if you would turn with me to 388. 
388. We'll say This is the body and the blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is for those who have been baptized into the body, the Church of Christ, and is continuing in the faith. I want to read into your hearing a very familiar passage concerning the institution of the Lord's Supper taking from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And I'll start reading at verse number uh, 23. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be unanswerable, will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. It has been discussed why we partake of the Lord's Supper each first day of the week. And the scripture text that some use to commune on the first uh, Sunday of the month is because of the passage that says, do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me, as to say, you don't have to do it every Lord's Day, just when you do it, do it like this. And that's what this passage is talking about. It's saying, when you do it, do it this way. But our example is by an apostolic example on in Acts 20 and 7 when they did it on the first day of the week. But well, we as Christians know that the first day of the week is a cycle. It comes around every Lord's Day. So we look forward to as Christians to partake of uh, these emblems each first uh, day of the week, which is today. 
So at this time, we will have the opportunity to do so, so you can take your communion packet, uh, take off the first layer, or peel back the first layer. If I can get mine open. And will you bow with me as we give uh, thanks for the loaf? Our precious Father in heaven, we come to you just now with bowed heads and humbled hearts, Father, thanking you for this day. Thanking you, dear God, for this opportunity that we have to come to this place collectively and worship you in spirit and in truth. As we recognize this communion, Heavenly Father, at this time in our service, we are thankful for this, this bread, Heavenly Father, which represents the body, and we're asking that we will partake of it in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable unto thee. This is our prayer that we ask in your precious son Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now peel back the second layer to have access to the fruit of the vine. And when you go with God in prayer with me again. Dear God in heaven, again we approach your throne, Father, thanking you for this day and your son Jesus, Heavenly Father, who came down from heaven, got up on that cruel cross of Calvary, Heavenly Father, to give us a right to the tree of life. Dear God, bless this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood. And again we ask, Father God, that we would take it in a manner pleasing and acceptable unto thee. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. That concludes our communion service. We're also commanded to give according to scripture on the first day of the week according to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 and 2. Uh, this is something that we as Christians should also look forward um, to doing, to giving cheerfully. Uh, God just asked us to give a small portion back to him and we know that God is so so good to us and he blesses us um, in far many ways that we give him credit for uh, so we have this opportunity now to give those who are at home even here if you choose to utilize uh, the paypal uh, link on the website you're encouraged to do that or if you need to mail a a check-in but this is the time that we are giving as as Utica and giving um, for this contribution. So let us go to God in prayer. Masterful Father in heaven, we're so very thankful to be on time side of life, Father, and we thank you for all the many blessings that you give us, dear God. Food, shelter, raiment, just a few, Father. Those things you protect us from that we have no idea and we know that you are so good to us, Father. We ask just now that these funds that are collected would be giving, uh, not grudgingly, but necessity, Father, for we know that you love a cheerful giver. Bless us, dear God, here at Utica. May we utilize these funds in a way that you will be pleased. We ask that you would be with us through the furtherance of this service. This is our prayer we ask in your precious son Jesus' name. Amen.
you would turn with me in Mark's song number 259. 259 will be our closing song, song of invitation. If you have that marked, if you'd turn with me to 211. 211, he will pilot me. say good morning to you, tell you how great it is to see everyone, express how great it is to, to be here, another glorious first day of the week that we can gather together to worship our Heavenly Father in spirit and truth. Um, it's been a, a glorious morning uh, being able to experience Bible class or Sunday school. We do want to encourage everyone to come out and uh, enjoy Sunday school together, uh, come out and enjoy worship together, and even on Wednesdays virtually to enjoy Bi Wednesday Bible class together. 
Uh, this morning, I want to talk to you from the subject, let's talk about life. Let's talk about life. Now, this subject matter, it's a very uh, difficult one, and I want you to understand that uh, I approach this topic uh, with humility um, uh, and a, a sense of um, meekness on this topic. Uh, I want you to know that, um, again, and I'll state it, we won't be able to cover everything, but we give you some foundational truths on this particular subject. It's not inspired uh, from one case or any individual's um, present life, but it's really a culmination of, of preaching for 15 years or so and having people talk to you and share with you um, certain things and certain uh, philosophies, ideas, and even their uh, theological understanding on the subject. And so it really is a necessary topic. It's a necessary topic, um, this topic about life. Um, and so I want us to understand that it's, it's not directed or aimed at any individual. If you would, uh, go with me to our Heavenly Father in prayer. God and Father, we thank you and we praise you again for all that you've given to us and everything you've done. We thank you for your son. We thank you for all the blessings we receive in him, Lord, even up until the point of being able to hear your word today. Learn from you, Lord, and strive to please you. We pray and ask that as we... Listen to your word, that our minds are focused, our hearts are receptive, and that we are learning the value of being more noble in spirit, Lord, as you teach us in your word, looking past the speaker and looking to you, studying behind all that is said, knowing that everything that is good and right and true and eternal belong to you, and all the mistakes, Lord, and all error that is expressed belong to the speaker. These things we pray and ask in Jesus' glorious name, amen. I want to read the passage again. If you will, go to uh, Philippians chapter 2. And I know that many of us, if not uh, most or all of us, are familiar with it. But I want you to look at it from uh, fresh. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to start with verse 25 from the New Revised Version. Paul says, Still, I think it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and co-worker and fellow soldier, your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for all of you and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. He was indeed so ill that he nearly died. But God had mercy on him and not only on him but on me also so that I would not have one sorrow after another. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, in order that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. Welcome him then in the Lord with all joy, and honor such people. Look at verse 30. Because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for those services that you could not give me. The name Epaphroditus was a very common name. At the time that the Apostle Paul was writing in the first century, uh, it was a very common name. His name means lovely and it's a derivative. It, it derives uh, from the Greek goddess Aphrodite in Roman God uh, Venus. And so this is where his name it derives from Aphrodite, and it means lovely. He is only mentioned in the New Testament scriptures, he's only mentioned in this book, in the book of Philippians, and he's mentioned in chapter 2 as we've, we've looked at, and he's mentioned also at the close of the book in chapter 4. And I want you to note and pay close attention to, to Paul when he first mentions him, and when he talks about Epaphroditus, it's really linked. We didn't read it, but it's really linked to, to Timothy. And he describes both Timothy and Epaphroditus as individuals that were considered in Paul's life to be valuable. That's very important. He says that they were valuable to the gospel. They were men that walked worthy of the gospel is what the implication is. Since these two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, dedicated their lives to serving the Lord and sacrificed 
their lives for the church. He says they were valuable to my life and to my ministry and to the church. This is important since from these verses we can learn a lot about life. If you look at it, there is a lot to be said about what Paul describes here about Epaphroditus, but, but I want us to look at it and to talk about it in terms of life. And by life, brothers and sisters, I mean the state of being alive. I want us to, to think about what the Bible describes and what the Bible teaches us about the state of being alive, being animated and possessing vitality, as James would put it, having the spirit of man within us and being able to say that we are what? That we are alive. I want to discuss that. And I want to discuss the ethical responsibility that we have as stewards of this life. How many of us really think about the, the ethical ramifications of being stewards of, of life and this, these bodies that God has given us? Since Paul, and I want us to think about this, Paul goes into a great into great detail about the life of Epaphroditus. But more specifically, he tells us what? That Epaphroditus almost died. That he almost died. And I know we, we tend to look at the spiritual implications of it, and we should. Paul mentions five powerful things about his character. He says that he's a brother, a co-worker, a fellow soldier, your messenger and minister to my need. So we look at it from the spiritual standpoint, and when we look at this passage, and we can learn a lot. But how many times have we thought about what Paul says and what the scriptures imply in terms of life? Being active, being vital, the state of, of being alive, because we can learn a lot from this passage of scripture. I want you to notice that Epaphroditus, the Bible says, that he became ill. I'm not, I'm not giving you some big revelation. It's right in your passage of scripture. Maybe we've looked over it, but again, notice that Paul says that he became ill in verse number 26. And he even talks about the fact that he was ill because he attempted to provide a service to Paul that the Philippians could not do. In other words, in the Greek, the implication is it's because the Philippians were not present. They were not physically present with Paul, that Epaphroditus provided a service to Paul that they could not provide since they were not in the same company physically. And because of this, Paul says that he became ill and he nearly died. It was during this time of providing this service on his way to Rome while Paul is in prison that he attends to certain needs and Paul says that he came close to death. But again, it's not just in my Bible, look at it in yours. Because he says that this illness didn't just happen while he was on the way to Rome. He didn't say he, he was on his way to do such and such and he was on his way to see me. He was on his way to provide and he became ill on his way. That's not all that Paul is saying. It's much more powerful than that. He says that this illness didn't just happen. It happened as a result. As a result of the service that Epaphroditus rendered to Paul and the believers in Philippi. Look at verse 30. Number Look at verse 30 again. Look at verse 29 and 30. He says, welcome him then in the Lord with all joy and honor such people because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life, risking his life to make up for those services that you could not give to me. So he says that the reason why he almost died was because he was providing a service. Paul describes Epaphroditus as risking his life or exposing himself to danger. That's what the implication is. He describes him as taking a gamble. In the Greek, it denoted, in our terminology, in our vernacular, Epaphroditus took a gamble with his life for the work of Christ. He took a gamble. Now think about what we would think in any other situation. If we were to do that, what would you think of me if I took a gamble with my life for some other reason other than a spiritual reason, what would you think? That's important for me to ask you that question. What would come to your mind if I did something where I risked my life and my life was greatly on the line for something that was frivolous? What would you think about me? Epaphroditus did the very same thing except his cause was what? For the work of Christ, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to give you some understanding here. In ancient times, there were certain brotherhoods, quote unquote, brotherhoods of Christendom. 
that took the responsibility of tending to the gravely sick. In other words, uh, many, many, many years ago, there were individuals that they formed a, a brotherhood. They were inspired of the scriptures. They deemed themselves as conscientious Christians, and so they would take it upon themselves to form this brotherhood. And whenever there was a pestilence, whenever there was sickness that would strike a town or strike a city or strike a group of people, they made it their lives to minister to those that were sick. Now, they didn't have a lot of what we could put on today. They would do so with whatever what was provided long, long ago, and they would risk their lives in order to minister to those who were sick through pestilence, through some uh, virus, or through some sickness, and they even dedicated themselves to burying those that, were, that died from that particular pestilence or from that particular um, uh, virus or whatever it was. They dedicated their lives to this dangerous, hazardous work. And these individuals historically were known as the Parabolani. The Parabolani. Now this name comes from the Greek word that Paul uses in Philippians chapter 2. When Paul says that he risked his life to make up for those services, it comes from the Greek word, the word parabolani that these brotherhood were known by. It comes from the Greek word, the same word that Paul uses here to describe Epaphroditus. In fact, it would be nothing for them to be called uh, the descendants, spiritually speaking of, in spirit, of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was steps, Paul says, away from dying because he risked his life to provide the Apostle Paul with certain necessities in order for Paul to continue to do what he did for the work of the Lord. Now again, Paul was in prison at this time and Epaphroditus provided this service. So this morning, these principles and truths that we're going to discuss to you, I pray that you have an open mind to God's word, that you really look at God's mind fresh and look at it with an open heart because these principles and truths that we are going to discuss understand that I can't cover everything. You guys wouldn't let me do that anyway. <laughs> but they do give us a great foundation in terms of God's word and what it is to be good stewards of this life that God has given to us. Making ethical decisions in totality, giving us a foundation to do so. My intent this morning, brothers and sisters, is to remind us and to teach us that God has the answer for everything in life. He has the answer for everything. And we ought to, as Christians, strive to please him by finding out what his word teaches. The Bible says that we ought to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. So I want to give you four biblical, biblical considerations from this passage as our foundation on what it is to be good stewards of this life. Ethical concerns. Number one, from this passage, we ought to see that the measure of Epaphroditus' risk was only justified by the greatness of his cause. The measure of his risk was only justified by the greatness of his call. And the risk, we already know, was tremendously great. Because Paul says what? That he came close to death. So the measure, and I, I want to impart that to you, the measure of his risk was tremendously great. But what was the cause? See, understand that Epaphroditus knew that making the decision to travel to Rome could cost him his life. He understood that before he took the venture. Now, we think about it in terms of planes and cars, but travel was much different. And can you imagine, and I want to put it in your mind's eye, I want you to, to consider, let's say, even to this very day, but I certainly want you to think about it in terms of the first century. Think about Epaphroditus, think about yourself. If you were given the task by yourself, and maybe a couple people would aid you, but you were given the main responsibility to take a care package and to take certain things that a whole congregation wanted an individual to have and you were responsible to take it all across the other side of the world. What would it do to you emotionally? And think about it in terms of the first century. 
Paul says that all of this distress and the strain and the energy that it involved, it almost cost Epaphroditus his life. He almost died for this cause. Again, we don't know all of the specifics about this, but we do know that, that there were dangers and he understood the dangers of it. He understood what traveling and doing all of these things for the church and on behalf of Philippi, for the Apostle Paul going to Rome, he understood all of it and yet he chose to do so. And if God had not intervened, if you look at it, the Bible says that if God had not intervened, what would have happened? He would have died. He says, but God had mercy on him, Paul says, but not only on him, but on me also, so that I would not have, what, one sorrow after another. He was as good as dead if God had not, what, shown mercy to him. And he knew that this was very possible. He risked it for the cause, was worthy of giving his life. He understood and he believed that what Paul meant to the world in the first century, what Paul would do for the church, what he would do for all the already established disciples and all of the disciples that Paul would later affect, he knew that giving his life was what? Was worthy of the cause. The cause was worthy of it. And he did what? He risked his life. Epaphroditus believed that the object of his sacrifice was worthy of his gift, the offering of his life. Now stay with me. His life. Good stewardship. This is what we see over and over in the scriptures. When we see the apostles or when we see the Christians in the first century, and even when we go into the Old Testament, men and women of God who were willing to give their lives and risk their lives, and some that lost their lives, they understood that that was good stewardship over the life that God had given to them. That's good stewardship. And we see it over and over. See, over the last several months, we have had to make decisions that potentially put our lives at risk too. Not from a spiritual standpoint necessarily, but we have had to make decisions that, that have put our lives at risk. For example, going to the grocery store. Who would have thought that going to the grocery store would risk your life, you had to risk your life to do so? But over the last 18 months or so, this is what it's been. And some of us have decided that we would go much less and some of us have decided that we wouldn't go at all. It, especially in the beginning of the virus. We have had to decide who will we let into our home. Some of us didn't even get to see some certain family members because it was a risk to our lives and we made those particular decisions or, or what people we would be around. We made decisions if we would wear masks or not. What situation would we wear masks even if we would have come to worship? To this building and we decided as a congregation that there was a period of time where the risk at that time we could worship virtually because the risk whether we actually went through those steps cognitively or not we said that the risk was at that time too great when we could do what worship virtually that's the reality of it we even made decisions or we're making decisions about a vaccine again this is not to, to sway anyone we just want to stick with God's word because we have been told that the vaccine gives us a chance at life in fighting this virus. What I'm saying to you is that as Christians, what we learn from this particular passage, two things should always be considered in terms of being stewards of this body, stewards of this life. Two things should always be considered. We learn it from here. Number one, first, what is the risk? What is the risk to my life, to my health, from a decision that I will make? When it involves our life, we have to ask ourselves, what is the risk? And this involves getting all of the information, and not just about a virus or a vaccine, but in everyday life, getting all of the information that we can from reliable sources, reliable sources, and making the best decision that we can. We make the best decision that we can, even altering those decisions if necessary when what? More information is given to us. We change it when we learn more about the information. See, sometimes we even have to decide between two things. Please hear me. We have to decide between two things that determine, to determine which what? Is the greater risk. What is the greater risk? If I do this, 
How much am I risking my life? If I do this, how much of my life am I risking? We have to sometimes even do that, to see what is the lesser risk in order to be good stewards of this body. So the first thing that we have to always think about is, again, what? The risk. And then secondly, we have to consider as Christians, we're not talking about the world now. We're talking about you and I as Christians. Does God consider the cause worthy of the risk? Does God consider it worthy? See, you, you don't belong to yourself. You were bought with a price, and we need to understand that. We have to ask ourselves as Christians, Epaphroditus did that. He said when he weighed it all, he said the gospel, and the gospel going to century after century, disciple after disciple for every generation, my life, my one life, is worthy of it. So we have to ask ourselves, does God consider the risk worthy? See, this involves learning as much as we can about what? What God says is worthiness, the word of God. Learning as much as we can from the mind of God, not on your own, not your own sixth sense, but studying God's word and letting God telling you, tell you what is worthy getting to understand his ways through scripture, his mind. See, of course, we have our first responsibility to our family. You can't even just always say what's best for my family because Epaphroditus, I'm sure, had people that loved him, but he looked at what, what was better for the church, too. When have we stopped caring about the church? We have to, to see these things as well. We have to understand what the mind of God is. And God never teaches us to be selfish. God never tells us that we can have and that it's all right to have a me mentality. That's not the Lord Jesus. We ought to have a Christ-like attitude. Again, consider Epaphroditus' actions. Consider the example of the apostles in the first century. And I remind you even from this book. Look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Paul says, if then there is any encouragement in Christ... Any consolation from love, any sharing of the spirit, any compassion, any sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. What does it say? Does your Bible say that? In humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And he goes on and he talks about the life of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, understand that the Bible teaches us that Epaphroditus was a great steward of the body that God gave him because he understood the risk and he understood risking for worthy cause. But number two, from this passage, his decision did not violate God's authority concerning life. Epaphroditus' decision did not violate God's authority over life. Since the act of risking his life in such a way was the work of the Lord, and I want us to think about this, what he did was the work of the Lord. Paul says it. And since this is the case, since he served the whole church, Epaphroditus actually was giving his life for Christ. He was actually giving his life for Christ. To die would have meant that he made an offering to the Lord. In fact, because the Lord had to intervene mercifully for him, he actually did give his life for Paul, for the service of God, and for the church of Philippi. He actually did give his life. But again, this is because he risked his life to meet a need, to meet a necessity for the church. There are ways, and please hear me here. Please listen to me. There are ways that we can risk our lives, brothers and sisters. There are ways that we can endanger our lives and even end our lives in a way that what? That violate the will and the authority of God's word. I remind you of Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, where the Bible describes and tells us who was the giver of life. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, same concept. 
But I'm going to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, verses 24 through 28. And as Paul is on Mars Hill and as he's talking to these Athenians, Acts 17, verse 24 through 28. This is what Paul is saying in this gospel proclamation. He speaks about God. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, he is he who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human minds as though he needed anything since he himself, what? Gives to all mortals life and breath in all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live. This is why, sidebar here, why we said in Sunday school this morning, why we ought to be thankful whether we live in America, whether we live in Cuba, wherever it is, because Paul says by inspiration that God determines the boundaries and the places where we live. He has his hand in that. So we, we're thankful for where we live, but Paul is talking about what? The origin of our life. The origin of our life. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live. So that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each of us. For in him we what? Live. That we move. And it's in him that we have our very being. As one of your own poets, Paul says, has said. What's your point, preacher? My point is to remind us that God and God alone is the giver of life. And I know we all agree to that as Christians. Only God gives life. He alone is the one that gives and no life, please hear me, no life should be taken apart from his will or apart from his authority. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 says that whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do what? All in the name of the Lord. In other words, by his authority. We do all by his authority. So we should make, we should never make decisions that take away life. That take away life, either our own life or whether we are responsible in some situation of the life of another person. This is what is implied in scripture. This is what Paul, and we're going to see it, what he implies in this very book. There is a reason, brothers and sisters, that in Matthew chapter 4, when the devil, the Bible says, the devil takes Jesus on the pinnacle of the temple, and he tells what? Jesus to do what? If you're the son of God, cast yourself down. In other words, God is not going to let anything hurt you. Now, what was the Lord's response? It is written, you should not what? Tempt the Lord your God. There's a reason why Jesus said that. Because Jesus is teaching us that even as the son of God, that there are ways that we can risk our lives or do something that is what? That is not in accordance to his authority, not in accordance to his will. And to do so would be taking something that we're just stewards of, Matthew, that really what? Don't belong to us. That don't belong to us. See, based on these truths that we speak to you today, we as Christians have rightly inferred when we teach the world, we're right because the Bible teaches us this, that God is the giver of life. And there are some things that go with that. There are some things that we need to understand on these truths that we speak about. Number one, what we are saying in essence is that all life then, if God is the giver of all life, guess what? It all belongs to him. All of it belongs to him. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, this is exactly what the prophet of God is saying, that all life belongs to God. All of it does. So we, we believe that and we know that. Man cannot treat his life or any other person's life any way that he desires. We can't do it. But number two, what is inferred in Scripture and what we believe is that life is sacred. When you talk about the sanctity of life, that's what you're saying. You're saying that the life that God gives, not only to man, but all life that God gives, you're saying that what? That life is holy because it comes from what? A holy God. 
That's what the word and the idea of sanctity involves. And because it's sancti sanctified, listen to me, please. What you are inferring is that as human beings and as Christians, it's man's duty to maintain it as long as there is life. We stand on maintaining life. That's what you profess when you profess uh, to be a Christian and when you profess that all life comes from the God of the Bible, you are in essence saying that the sanctity of life means that we as Christians believe that man's responsibility is to make every effort to maintain life. See, it's not every day that we face situations like Epaphroditus or even what we are experiencing in our current time. But absent of the need to quote unquote risk our lives in an extraordinary way. If you take the extraordinary ways out of it, we always say that you uphold life. Why do we dispel this idea in current situations? See, this means that we make decisions that will reflect our own respect and our own reverence for life. That's what you're saying when you say that all life comes from God, that it's sanctified. That is, there's a sanctity to it. But number three, you're saying that man does not therefore determine what life is quality. We don't have the right to say, well, you know, this person has this or they have that, so their life is of greater quality. They have more life than this person has life. We don't have the right to say that, brothers and sisters. And this is what, we, what we've been preaching for years. See, scripture has already told us that all life, all life, no matter the condition, if it's truly life, it's truly life, then it must be preserved. It doesn't matter what you think as a human being. Your opinion doesn't matter to God. What matters to God is his will. And if you're a Christian, then that ought to matter to you. It ought to matter to you. I, I'm not trying to, to get someone to, to, to take the vaccine. I'm just simply telling you to apply God's word where it ought to be applied. I'm not telling you to wear a mask. I'm not telling someone that's listening virtually uh, about abortion or whether they, I'm telling you, look at God's word and let God be true in every man a liar. The Bible teaches us that no matter what the stage is of life, no matter what men believe to be a worthwhile life, that if there's truly life, then to God it's all the same. I'm going to take you, stay in the same book. Look at Philippians chapter number one. And I want you to think about it. I know we're, we're almost over time, but this is important. And I'll conclude our last two points very quickly. But consider the Apostle Paul's life at the time that he's writing this letter to Philippi as he's talking about Epaphroditus. We already know that this is one of Paul's prison letters. And in chapter number 1, verse 20, let's look at what Paul says here. Philippians chapter 1, verses 20. We're not going to read all the way to verse 30. We'll skim through a little bit. But Paul says, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, in other words, as long as I have life, no matter how much life I have, that means fruitful labor for me and I do not know which I prefer. Look at carefully what he's saying here. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. And that's when he says, only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. But now look at it. Paul already tells you what his desire is. He was not hard pressed between Marvin two desires. That's not what Paul says. Am I right about it or not? Paul says my desire, my sole desire Matthew, Brother Dana, is what? Is to depart this life and be with Christ for that's far better. But to remain in the flesh so he's talking about what is his desire 
juxtaposed to what? What was necessary for them. He says, if it were for me, I would end my life today. If it were my power, I would go and be with Christ today. But it's not mine to take. It didn't, I didn't give it to myself. I cannot decide when I leave. And since I am convinced that God still has work for me to do, no matter what it is. Now think about Paul's situation. Now it's easy for us to sit in our comfortable building with our air conditioning and our suits and in our clothes and say that it wasn't that difficult what Paul was going through, but Paul was in prison. You put one of us in prison and we're going to want to die. And Paul says that my quality of life is not a factor in determining whether I what? Live here or whether I stay. Because Paul's situation was a very dire situation. Paul's situation, he couldn't go as he wanted to go. He couldn't eat as he wanted to eat. He was in prison. And yet he says, it's just not mine to give. It's not mine. We ought to understand that. We're stewards. See, Paul understood that it was not his right to use his circumstance as a decision on whether he lived or died. He didn't use his desire and his wants as a source of whether he lived or died. And we see this over and over in scripture. Think about Job. If anybody had a right to determine that life was no more worth living, Job had a right. And Job, in Job chapter 3, verse 20, he implies his understanding of what? That I didn't give myself life. I cannot determine. No matter how difficult it is, when it ends. Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 19. We know of his struggle. Jonah, chapter 4, verse 3. We may look at it for frivolous reasons and, and look at it as, as frivolous, but Jonah, he understood that God is the giver of life. They, they knew these decisions belonged to God. And this is with our own lives. Whether we are responsible for someone else or whether we're responsible for our own selves, we have to consider these things. No matter the stage, no matter the stage, there's a reason why we as Christians are against abortion. Psalm 139, I know we're over. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 18 puts it this way. Look at this beautiful, the beautiful passage. Psalms 139, verse 13, David says, For it is with you who formed my inward parts. It was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, speaking about his mother's womb, your eyes beheld my unformed substance, and your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to an end. I am still with you. So when folks say that at conception that's not a baby, God says, I beg to differ. So any stage, whether it's in the very beginning of stages or whether it's the very end, we may see our older people and our elderly walking over bent. Some of them cannot walk. Some of them have all types of condition. And yet, to God, there is no such thing as a quality of life. We ought to stop using that phrase because to God, life is what? It's life. And we don't have a right to determine these things. No book records the history of men living into older years than the scriptures. We have the Bible as a source of showing the longevity of men and how men were willing to put up with all of the aches, the pains, and all of the rigors of older age. No book describes it like the Bible does. But this also means that we cannot determine the quality by one's sickness. Think about all of the people that in Jesus' day were infirmed, that were blind. Think about all of those things and how the Bible describes it. Jesus healed them, but he didn't give them reasons to end their life or take their life. And all this means, in other words, and my point is this, we must learn, brothers and sisters, please hear me, we must learn and gather as much information as we can to determine what gives ourselves or others the greatest chance of life. And we must always, according to scripture, choose life. This means whether it is wearing a mask, 
I'm not telling you to wear a mask. Just determine whether or not it is more risky or not. Not from what some unreliable source tells you, whether it's best for you in the preservation of your life and as Epaphroditus did in the lives of others to wear a mask. Or whether it's getting a vaccine. And it may be that you have to take a risk, but you have to, as a Christian, determine which is riskier. And I'm not giving you that answer. I, I don't know. You have to determine that between you and God. Whether it is riskier to not get the vaccine, whether it's riskier to your life, or whether it's less risk to get it. You have to look at what God's word says because we are responsible. We're supposed to be responsible stewards. So even in situations like folk, and this, is, this goes beyond the virus, a comatose state. Maybe you have been given the responsibility of a loved one if they fall ill or your spouse, or maybe something in the past. It's not to make anyone feel guilty, because we've done the best that we could with the knowledge that we've given. But I'm telling you, in 15 years of preaching, I cannot tell you how many times this issue has come up. And we have to seek God's mind. When I was a, a younger man, and my grandmother, my mother's mother, was alive. And I can remember when, when Jack Kevorkian was, was in his prominence, and he was very popular in Michigan, and really in America and all in the news almost daily and I can remember sitting at my grandmother and my grandfather's table and, and listening to the news with them and my grandmother at the time who believed that she was healthy even though she was not saying that it was a person's right. It's really surprised me it was a person's right whether or not they wanted to live with a condition that was denoting sickness and pain and hurt. Well, later my grandmother was diagnosed with lung cancer, and I'm telling you, she did everything she could to live. That's the attitude that the Bible teaches us. If it belongs to God, if God were to put money directly into your hands, a thousand dollars into your hands, hypothetically, if the Lord were to come down, what would you do? Would you be frivolous with it, or would you do all that you could to preserve it? and to get the most that you could out of that. Isn't it what the Bible teaches us? It's the same with life, brothers and sisters. One of the most precious gifts, if not the most precious gift, besides our soul, is this earthly life. And it's, it's not right for us to make decisions, in other words, that have to deal with what I want, what I believe is best for me, or even confine it to just my family, when we see this powerful example. And when we have individuals and loved ones that we are responsible for, whether they're in comatose or whether they're in a vegetative state, it's not enough for us to just say, well, the doctors say that there's not, we have to do our own research, we have to do our own studies. When someone is given cancer, or given the diagnosis of cancer, they don't have the right to say, in essence, that I'm not going to take this treatment that the doctors say will preserve my life. It's not yours to make that decision. We do all that we can to preserve life. Every day, we're learning more about this, and we're learning more about technology and what it's able to do. We have to become more informed and make biblical decisions. Very quickly, I know, give me two minutes, number three, from this passage. Epaphroditus cared how his grave condition affected the church. He cared how his condition affected the church. Paul says, I'm sending him back. You send him to me, I'm sending him back as quickly as I can. Verse 26, verse 28, because he heard that you found out that he was ill. He's been in distress himself. And so I'm sending him back so that, that you will see that he is okay. But he was more concerned with their distress than he was his own life. And we ought to think about that too. It's a powerful example for us. We ought to care about how our sickness will what? Affect people that love us. We ought to care. To him, it was a burden on them that he wanted to alleviate them from. So Epaphroditus cared how his grave condition affected the church. And then finally, God cared how his condition affected Paul. God cared. He said God had mercy on him. What we ought to do, and whatever the condition is, 
is my brother Marvin talks about is when we have brothers and sisters that are sick, we ought to pray, pray, and pray. We ought to pray. If you're here this glorious Lord's Day morning and you have not obeyed the gospel, whether you're here in the audience or whether you're listening virtually, we want to urge you today to obey the gospel through faith, repentance, confession, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. God promises upon your confession and your obedience that he will give you the crown of life on that day that no man can take away provided you walk faithfully unto death. And if you are a Christian and you need to come, this message was not to make anyone feel guilty. Maybe we've made decisions in the past that we just didn't have the knowledge of. God is a loving and a merciful and a forgiving God. But with what we see in Scripture, what we have preached in other ways to other folk in other forms, we need to be consistent as well. I have a problem sometimes myself. At least I used to when I was sick or something that may have been a serious going to the doctor. It's not mine, Matthew, to make that decision. I have not only a family that is depending on me, that loves me, I have a church family, and I have a God that I'm responsible for. Personal martyrdom is not all right with God. And so, if you're here and you need to come, come right now. I'll be together standing while we sit.
go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for this day, just for this opportunity that we've had to be here together and to worship you. We are so thankful, Lord, for the message that we heard today. We pray that we can take it out into the world and apply it to our lives and, and teach others, Lord. We pray that we can work harder, Lord, that we can learn to be good stewards of our lives and of your word and, and just show others the way that you would have us to live. We pray, Lord, that you will be with all of those who were mentioned in the announcements this morning, Lord. We pray for the sick of this congregation and family members and friends who are sick. We pray for those who are grieving in this congregation. And again, Lord, for those who are anxious or worried about anything, Lord, we just pray that you will be with all of us because we know that, that you are and that you, that you can, Lord. We're just so thankful to serve such a powerful and living God. Pray, Lord, that you will be with us as we leave here, that we can get to our home safely and return at the next appointed time so thankful, Lord, we pray that you will forgive us of our sins and guide us to sin no more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.